This is a Healthier Michigan podcast, episode 29. Coming up, we discuss the effects of social media on adolescents. Welcome to a Healthier Michigan podcast, the podcast dedicated to navigating how we can improve our health and well-being through small, healthy habits we can start implementing right now. I'm your host, Chuck Gatica. Every other week, we'll sit down with a certified health expert from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan to do a deep dive into topics covering nutrition, fitness, and now today's social media and a whole lot more. On this episode, we're talking about social media. And with me today, Dr. Kristen Gregory. She's a medical director in behavioral health at Blue Care Network of Michigan and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Dr. Gregory received her medical degree from Chicago School of Osteopathic Medicine. She also completed residency training in adult psychiatry at Henry Ford and had a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at Wayne State University. There's so many big words to throw at me, you know, this early in the day. She's board certified in adult, child, and adolescent psychiatry, previously practiced in a variety of settings in the Metro Detroit area, including inpatient residential, outpatient, and juvenile justice programs. She's had a private practice where she treated children and adults with a variety of uh, mental health issues, as well as consults for local school districts. And it's good to see you. You too, Chuck. Nice to have you with us. So here we are. Isn't it ironic? We're talking about how social media can affect adolescents. Our kids, right? You've got two kids. I've got five. And now my kids are starting to have kids. So I'm well aware of what's shifting right before my eyes generationally. But we're talking about it while we are also embracing Social right. media, right? Exactly, yep. Isn't that the funny? The irony of it. Yeah. So there's good and bad to it, right? Yeah, nothing is all good or all bad. I think there's definitely good parts of social media that yeah. we can use, but there's cautions as well. So this allows us for our ability now to stay not just connected, but hyper-connected. And you were giving me an, an example while you were on spring break last month. I mean, here we are, you know, the April showers have brought May flowers, so we're farther down the road, but... Tell us a little bit about that, because you are able to peek in on where your friends are. Yeah, on social media, uh, my daughter, she was peeking in, I think it was on Snapchat, about where her friends were all over the country. So she could see where everybody else was on spring break. She was in Florida, whereas other people were, you know, in Europe or Bali, all around the world. But it's it's that real-time, constant connection. So no matter it be 11 o'clock at night or, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, you always connected and kids now really they strive for that they fear that they're going to miss out on something if they're not always checking so for your daughter and i guess uh, it may be different than for the world at large right checking in on, on somebody in bali as nice as florida is right somebody's in bali and somebody's in europe is she reveling in that like oh, way to go look where my friends are or is that giving her a wah 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 you know kind of day well, yeah i mean sometimes she should be like wow i wish we were in bali i said i wish we were too <laughs> <laughs> yeah right we, we all wish we were in bali <laughs> at times right so let's talk a little bit about this idea of, of social media in the sense of how fast this has progressed right before our eyes. And some of our kids are only 10 years old. I mean, on top of it, right? Right, exactly, yeah. So 10-year-olds have cell phones and access to this at all times. Like yeah. you were saying that your phone, that's your wallet. So it's always with you. You get your credit cards in it. You have everything that you need for your day right. on that phone. And so from a social media standpoint, kids are not going to worry about their driver's license and a a credit card. But they, too, truly believe everything they need, including access to information, is in that device. Exactly. Yep. They think that if they don't have that, a lot of kids will get upset because they need that constant contact. Mm -hmm. And psychologically, then, how is that manifesting itself short of what I can experience in my own life where sometimes I'm, I'm, I can see my knee is jumping because I think, oh, somebody better answer me really fast. But what, psychologically, what are we going through? Exactly. It can lead to a lot of anxieties if somebody doesn't return your text message right away or they mm-hmm. not let you know where they're located in the world. It can also lead to anxiety that you're missing out, this whole fear of missing out. If I'm not attached to the social media at all times, what am I missing? What are the other kids doing? So it can lead to a lot of anxiety, but it can also lead to a sense of connectedness. Mm -hmm. So social media is not all bad. It can also lead to, you know, the sense of connectedness and reaching out to people that maybe you couldn't because they're different parts of the world and kind of break that loneliness. 
So we're in the studio recording the podcast, and I've turned my phone off. I don't really get any kind of tick from that, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not experiencing the downside. To me, it's freedom. Right. So for kids, is that different? Yeah, a lot of times it is different. They're afraid that they're going to miss out because they're so used to. They grew up with it. Instant contact, that instant gratification, Mm -hmm. that instant needing to know where somebody's at. Before, when I was in med school, we had to research everything. I had to go to the library. They didn't, you know. Right. But now you can do all your research on your smartphone. I mean, so. And how does that concern you as a parent, as a mom, and me as a dad that, yeah, we can research everything, but is Wikipedia really true? Even if it says Britannica.com, is it really truth? No. Um, and at the schools, a lot of the schools do a good job at telling you, you know, that Wikipedia is not a good source of information. Right. Right. But unless you get that message directly, a lot of people will believe everything that they read on the Internet. So one of the important things is teach your kids about the permanency of the Internet, really. So anything that you might post on there is possibly going to be on there forever. Right. And, you know, my kids are old enough now, and as they were going into the job world, I kept saying to them before they got there, just remember that crazy dancing on the table and the sprinkler. Yeah. Not like I'm, I have any experience. I'm just saying that, you know, that may be something that a prospective employer is going to search someday, right? And a lot of them do. Yeah. 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 So if we have a, and you've mentioned this, I don't know how many times, maybe three. So I'm just reflecting back to what I've heard, fear of missing out. Right. How does that manifest itself psychologically? I, I, okay. So I'm, I'm fearful. I may miss out. But really what's going on internally What's happening all the way up to the brain? What's going on? Kids, especially young adolescents, their peer group is so important to them. So being connected to their peer group and feeling like they belong with their peer group, because at that age is when their peer group really becomes more important than their family connections. Mm. And that's a normal developmental task. So that's not abnormal. But I think social media can lend itself to heightening the anxiety that you're not connected with that peer group and sometimes a sense of loneliness if you're not included in a group chat or you're not included as among somebody's friends. Mm-hmm. can also lead to poor choices. So kids, you know, could get upset or angry with one of their peers and fire off, you know, a comment that can really uh, affect somebody negatively and have them lower their self-esteem and lead to a lot of self-doubt and but we've seen this as adults, too, when you try to text or write an email back to somebody and they interpret the tone. Right. It comes off snarky to them and you had no intention. You were just trying to do it fast. Text messages can't have tone. That's what I was. <laughs> Neither <Yeah>. can emails. <laughs> yeah. But for kids, that's got to be vastly different because their level of experience in life, you know, maybe up to 12 years. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they don't know that lesson necessarily unless parents teach it to them. And then anxiety in them would, in the sphere of missing out or for any reason with social media, how do we as parents, how do we as siblings look for that in our own family's life? How does that anxiety manifest itself? It can manifest as changes in behavior, tearful episodes, Hmm. isolating from family and friends, uh, as well as a lot of younger kids, that anxiety and maybe depression or feeling sad can actually manifest as irritability. So sometimes kids that are anxious or on edge are a little snappy and snarky with their parents. Mm -hmm. Changes in behavior, changes in friendship groups are the other thing that you want to look for, as well as, you know, frank statements that they're depressed or, you know, feel isolated. So when I was a kid, and maybe you as well, bullying meant something different, right? It's not that it wasn't less important because I've had friends and even family members who I would try to relate my experience with bullying to somebody else's. I don't internalize things. I'm sort of like a duck. Stuff kind of rolls off my shoulders and I'm like, yeah, okay, let's move on. Time to do other things. Other people internalize. But now there's this notion of cyberbullying, right? right? So part of it could be a misinterpreted text, but part of it is purposefully hurtful. Right, it's purposely hurtful. And instead of when you were and I were growing up where somebody bullied you, not everybody knew about it. When you get cyberbullied, it kind of puts it on this whole platform where everybody can see what's happening to you. And then kids might jump on or, you know, be mm-hmm. fearful of coming to your defense, you know, and alienating other friends that they might have. Yeah. And I think in this case, don't we owe it to ourselves as parents? For the most part, we're talking about an age group where we still are paying the bills for right. the most part. Don't we have some, not just right, but don't we have a right to their own, our kids' health? That there are times where we, we may have to say, turn that thing off or give me that phone or 
I'm sorry, it's just going away forever. Yeah, definitely. I think that there's times where parents have to set limits and they also have to be aware of what social media outlets that their kids are utilizing. Mm. For example, that might look like being your child's friend on Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, all the way up to if you don't have that account, having Snapchat on your phone where you've signed into your kids' accounts, you can see what they're posting and what their friends are posting to them so you can just be aware. But for you to have access to that, that's sort of like reading my diary to a lot of people, right, when you're a kid. So you've got to have a conversation with your kids so they know you've got the password, right? Or, I mean, right. You have to have a conversation and there has to be rules about internet safety too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that that's, you know, before kids get a smartphone or before they have access to that, that parents uh, should have a conversation with them. Yeah. And it's almost like you you have to create a pact so they understand this is serious business, right? Right. As well as consequences for violation of the pact, let's yeah, say. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned as we move from cyberbullying, which can lead to this anxiety and depression, there is one step that we've heard and we've seen stories about going further. And I know you would have some experience in this idea of kids expressing at least suicidal thoughts. Right. How concerned and what are the red flags that we would be looking for? You know, sometimes we can see kids put that out there actually on social media. So sometimes that can be a good opportunity, you know, to intervene at that point. Maybe you didn't know what was going on and then they post it out on the social media. But the problem with that is, is that there's not a bunch of counselors or therapists Mm -hmm. or mental health professionals Mm -hmm. there to save them. But they would be posting what? Would they be so direct as saying they're contemplating? We've seen, yeah. Really? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So... That's a big red flag or, like I said before, changes in behavior or saying that they don't want to be around or those are things that parents need to take very seriously. Mm -hmm. And is it strictly the notion that they're verbalizing it? Does that alone take it to the next level of concern for us as parents? I don't think that it always does take it to the next level where something drastic has to happen, but I think that anytime somebody vocalizes that, it has to start a conversation you know, Mm -hmm. with trusted adults, mental health professionals, uh, to make sure and assess that the situation is safe. So this notion, too, that we see so much time, screen time, right, on our uh, smartphones, when you have a young person who you are hoping is going to grow healthy, you're going to make sure they have a good breakfast, you make sure you cook dinner, you know, whatever you're doing. But when you have kids that are on these things up until the wee hours of the night, and then they have to get up early, Sleep deprivation itself isn't just about a bad mattress. I mean, it's... Yeah, that blue light going into their eyes late at night, it tricks the brain into thinking that it's daytime, basically. You mean even off of a phone? Yeah, definitely, because Hmm. it's so close to their face. And so you can adjust the settings, but that doesn't take away the risk. Plus, kids will be up all night waiting for that chime, let's say, or the buzz, you know, that there's been a response, so... I think definitely setting limits, screen time limits is important across all age groups, really. But what is the blue light doing again? It's going into your, through your eyes because in your eyes mm-hmm. pick up that light and it senses, your brain senses that it's daytime. I and see. it affects the production of melatonin. Mm-hmm. Which is a brain, natural Which is thing. a sleep chemical, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. basically it tells our brain that it's day, not night. So have you had to deal with this with your own kids? Like, what, what's the, what are you going to tell your kids at night? Obviously, this is on the nightstand. Right. Right, and it's going to be next to you or somewhere close because they want to have it plugged into the charger. So what, what's the alternative? Tell them to keep it in the kitchen so they can go to bed and have a restful night? I think that every kid's different, obviously, but when, you know, you see a pattern where, you know, your child might be up all night texting on there or searching social media, that maybe having it downstairs, having your phone downstairs if you're sleeping upstairs or in a different part of the house, so it's Mm -hmm. not right next to you, and then Mm -hmm. you can kind of monitor it that way. I've done that with my kids. Have you? Uh, I got a flag back, though, that that's how they use their alarm to wake up. Right. So buy you an old school alarm, then you can have (laughs) an old plug-in one. Yeah, but that is a good argument, really, when you think about it, because everything is... It's Be just, sure to tell them that. <laughs> or, yeah, right. But it, it, it is like me saying I'm carrying my credit card and my driver's license. It is the all thing to me. Now, right. I don't use it like that, but I'm not hooked on it, but it is the thing I need to carry right. to just get by. So we've talked about fear of missing out. Is it strictly that they're fearful of missing out on what friends are doing? Because aren't you, in a way, you're living your life vicariously or otherwise, feeling down about it. So what, what are these young people fearing that they're missing out on, truly? 
that whole social connection. So what is somebody going to say? Is there an event or a get together going on, let's say that I wasn't invited to or I wasn't part of? Hmm. So it's just that sense of connectedness that they're searching, which, you know, ironically can actually lend itself to a feeling of increasing isolation. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of kids and young teens will actually rate social media use as a positive thing, though. So they all feel that it's a positive aspect of their life. So they definitely don't rate it as negative. Yeah. And I don't think that it has to all be negative. It's just when it becomes too much, it, anything that's too much without balance becomes something to be concerned with. So we've talked about the upsides for adolescents, but there are upsides for adults too when it comes to social media, right? Right. With adults, me professionally, even LinkedIn, mm. other sites, a lot of times can enhance, you know, what you're doing professionally. You can find jobs. You can find uh, that connection. Yeah. And adults as well can find a social connection as well. Now, I know I'm old. My kids tell me, but I, I'm old, but I'm watching now LinkedIn becoming like Facebook used to be. You know, I'm watching this changeover of what, uh, you know, something has been, the fun cat video is now appearing on LinkedIn. I'm not even looking for a job, but really? I'm seeing this stuff and I'm thinking, what's going on? So have you gotten that feedback from your own kids about how out of tune? You're just not with it, Dad, if you're on Facebook. I mean, that's for old people. Yeah, that's Have you what, heard that? That's what my kids tell me. Do they really? Yeah, Facebook's for old people. And that yeah, yeah. Twitter is for, you know, people in their 20s, and (laughs) Snapchat's the new thing for the teens. Yeah. It's hard to keep up. It is hard to keep up. So this idea that we've got all of their passwords, oh my gosh, you know, how do we keep up with all that they're doing? Right. And then they can go in and, I mean, they're much more savvy than we are, obviously, as adults. Do you know my wife declared her independence? She got off of Facebook. She told all of her Facebook friends, and hers is different than mine. I use mine So people know who I am. So mine's a a different universe, right? I would say arguably most of the Facebook friends, sorry, Facebook friends, are not my real friends. Right. In her case, she kept it just for family and and family and extended family connections and then friends. But even then she said, I'm taking a break. And she just waved the flag and said, I'll let you know when I'm back. Is that healthy by itself? Yeah, I think definitely that's healthy. You're taking a break, even if you just take a break for a few hours every day. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that have taken a break, you know, over the season. They've taken a break, you know, until Easter for Lent. Sure. So a lot of people would give up social media and they're not giving up pop anymore. Digital fasting. Yeah. Right? Digital fasting. Yeah. I mean, it's a good idea (laughs) when you think about it. So I want to give people some news they can use, you know, some takeaways for this idea as we're watching our adolescent kids so that we have, you know, not just the red flags we talked about, but as kids can be navigating through the world, which can be tough at times, how we are looking out for their mental health issues and how they can combat it. So outside of us, who already they're saying we're too old because we're on Facebook. So they, we may not have the connection that an aunt or an uncle, trusted family friend, somebody, a pastor has, right? School, right? school social worker, right. you know, teacher, trusted adult, basically, a you know, mental health professional, if somebody's, you know, already in therapy or thinking mm-hmm. that they need it, but somebody... The, the child feels that they can, or adolescent, feels that they can talk to, feels that they can relate to and is safe. But where do you have that conversation with your kid? Is it way in advance before there's even ever, or if ever, a problem that rises? I think that, yeah, having that conversation before your child gets on social media is important. Mm. So I think, you know, a child gets a cell phone or, you know, an iPod or something that they're going to communicate with before they get on these sites that there needs to be a conversation about internet safety. There mm-hmm. needs to be a conversation about cyberbullying. There needs to be a conversation about the permanency of the internet and anything that they post. And like you were saying before, how that could affect your future. I mean, kids aren't thinking, obviously. They think now. Yeah. They're not thinking, well, you know, 20 years from now, maybe I'm going to want to be president and this might be a bad thing. But as their parents, we have the right to, you know, the responsibility to guide them and really be that force, you know, that's mm-hmm. monitoring that as well as giving them what they can do if they get in trouble or if they start to feel depressed or if they mm-hmm. start to feel anxious, who they can go to. And is it not appropriate for us as adults to find that uh, my brother or sister, their favorite cool aunt or uncle or somebody that we can go to and say, listen, could you, could you come alongside them for a minute and just see if there's something up? No, I think that's totally appropriate because sometimes that might be who the child will relate to. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously, 
you're not always going to have necessarily the relationship where kids might feel initially open with you, but having somebody right. that they feel that they can communicate with is important. So the idea that we've all we've got all these passwords. I mean, God bless all these young people who have it all memorized, and I, I I'm I'm pretty good at it, right? So you've got a password. Are we in a world where kids share their passwords? So somebody else is getting in without hacking? Some kids do share their passwords, and you know that's a big concern. Is if you use the same password, let's say for other things, mm-hmm. it, you know, I've seen kids where their account got hacked into, or somebody that they thought was their friend, or you know, somebody yeah. that was their friend for a period, and then they had a falling out, and then that person can get in and kind of wreak havoc with their site or what they're posting and post things that the child isn't even aware of. So, you know, the takeaway for me in this entire discussion has been keep the communication lines open the best we can, right? Mm -hmm. Open meaning sometimes you have to listen and you might hear things that you didn't necessarily want to hear or might make you a little bit uncomfortable as a parent, but you know, keeping an open mind and making sure mm-hmm. that your child feels like they can come to you is very, very important. So you've got a few uh, websites you'd like to give us. So again, as a takeaway of places we can go to find more information. Right. Michigan, a lot of the schools participate in the OK to Say program. Mm-hmm. And so that if you had a concern with a friend of yours or you had a concern that you'd seen bullying or you'd seen substance use, it's an anonymous way that kids or educators can connect to a main site Uh, and say, I'm concerned, and then the school would get a phone call, actually, and there would be an intervention that way. So it's not just for kids? No, it's not just for kids, but it's a way that kids, you know, can feel comfortable, you know, reaching out if they're concerned about somebody or they're concerned about themselves in more of an anonymous way, and somebody's not going to get mad at you because, you know, you vocalize some concern about them. And the CDC has a website as well? Yep, uh, how to prevent bullying as well as internet tips, Mm -hmm. safety tips. And, you know, if you are concerned about your kid, child, adolescent, it's also able to reach out to a mental health professional, a therapist, counselor, like you said before, pastor, somebody to kind of intervene and see, make sure that things are safe at home. Well, it's good to have you on the show, Dr. Kristen Gregory. Good to have you with us today. And a lot of good stuff because... We're so concerned about these kids and raising our kids the right way. And, and, you know, we often see them go off into the world and we're like, okay, we did something right. And I think this has got to be one of the major things that we've got to deal with. Right. Yeah. Life's become more complicated. Yeah. You know, it's more complicated raising kids. It's moving so fast, so fast. It makes your head spin. Well, Dr. Kristen Gregory has been here, Director of Behavioral Health at Blue Care Network of Michigan and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. She's been so helpful in making us understand that sometimes... Kids can't get away from social media. Kids, we can't get away from it. It's okay to take a digital fast from time to time because the downside can be loneliness, social isolation, anxiety. But the upside is we've got access to this world of information that can be so great and can actually be so helpful. So there's there's a good way to go through the world and balance this all out. We're glad you've been here listening to a Healthier Michigan podcast. It's brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. If you like the show, you want to know more, check it out. Here's the website, ahealthiermichigan.org slash podcast. You can leave a review or a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. You can get uh, new episodes on your smartphone <laughs> or your tablet or, you know, you can, anywhere you want to go. We're there as well, <laughs> but we're part of the upside, right? We're hoping we're part of the upside. Or you can subscribe, and let me tell you what that means. You can subscribe for my favorite price, free 99. It's absolutely free. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Along with Dr. Gregory, I'm Chuck Gatica. Have a great day.